prophets are a strange breed of men. They're God's emergency men for crisis hours. And the price of being a prophet is that a man has to live alone. All God's great men have been very, very lonely men. I said very often that when I, when I turn over the pages of the Bible, that one of the most challenging pages is the white page that divides the Testaments. It's a white page, but it covers a period of 400 years of total darkness. 400 years of darkness without any light. 400 years of silence without any prophetic voice. If I were to say to you tonight, I'll give you paper and pencil and you can write and give me from your knowledge of the Word of God, who was the greatest man that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ? I guess you might come up with Moses, or you might come up with Paul, and you'd be wrong, because the greatest character reader of all time was Jesus himself, and he said that the greatest man that was ever born of woman was John Baptist. A man who spent some 20 years there in the fastness of the desert. A lonely man, a strange man. And as dear told you used to say, if you're going to be a prophet, brother, you better settle. Or it was Dr. Parker who originally said, if you're going to be a prophet, you'll have to preach repentance. And before you start, dedicate your head to heaven, because you won't last much more than six months, maybe. John the Baptist himself didn't. He went into the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Oh, I'd love to have heard John Baptist preach, wouldn't you? I'd like to have seen this man when God said, John, you've been here 20 years now, you better go out and preach. I told him this morning it takes God 20 years to make a man, it took him 20 years to make John Baptist, and then he preached for six months. You boys went to Bible school for six months and been preaching 20 years, no wonder you're dry. <coughs> you better go back, go back to the wilderness, go back to the desert, get into the loneliness. There's nothing on God's earth like silence. Just take your Bible, forget everything and everybody, and shut yourself away till that you have a new revelation from God himself. But John wore no strange garments. He was strange by the fact he wore only a leather girdle around his loins. That was his strange dress. He was no gourmet. He didn't go through the, uh, you know, the long, long menu and say, well, I, I don't know, my jaded appetite, there's nothing. You sure you don't have shrimp with a special dressing or something? He just caught the flies as they were going past. The locusts. Pulled the wings off and put them on a hot rock. He had locust burgers every day. <laughs> Breakfast, dinner and supper. A lot of people want Jesus to come today because they're scared sick of suffering, that's why. After all, the church has been getting lashed and tormented and stripped and prostituted. 400 years and God never moved. 400 years of ritual and formality of sacrifice and all the ritualism that they went through. But somehow, it was a form of godliness. And God decided to upset the apple cart, if you like. What did he do? Send a legion of angels? No, 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 no. He took a little man out of a baby out of the womb of its mother. He separated this man and he educated him in the spirit and sent him into the wilderness. And he came out and he had no forward man and he asked for no program. And he wasn't seeking prestige and he didn't beg for anybody's power. And he didn't find some secret way of promotion. If you'd walk down the desert there, you could hardly tell a man the color of his skin was he, he was sunburned on the inside and fire baptized on the inside and, and, and fire baptized with the sun on the outside and you could almost see the way he'd gone because his tears were rising like steam off the ground. They have broken my laws. You see, we think if we're really blessed and successful evangelists, you get a bigger home, a bigger car, more prestige, and brother, you feel good because now you can buy $150 suits 
when I do all thirty dollar suits not too long ago. But brother, if you moved up with God, I'll tell you what you're doing. Your heart's more broken now than it was when you started ten years ago. You see the nation going downhill more rapidly than she's ever gone before. Prostitution is increasing, crime is increasing, immorality is increasing, lawlessness is increasing. And in the richest, most comfortable country in the whole world, we stink in the nostrils of Almighty God tonight, and England is equally true, it's equally true of England as well. Ah, the prophets were men who walked with God. They felt like God. They saw like God. They wept like God. They yearned like God. They had no satisfaction in seeing the beauty of the temple, the ritual, the formality, all the things that they went through. No, 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 no. God has gone from them. We keep up the formality. The money is coming in. People are nice. One or two come to the altar. But oh, what a difference when a man gets a heart that craves for revival, that longs that God will make various are, that a whole nation will have to acknowledge. When John Baptist came, he came with no lip that was buttoned. He had nobody to please. He had no program. He had no priorities that he was trying to push ahead. He never raised a dead man. No, he didn't raise a dead man. He raised a dead nation. And he did it without the miraculous in the realm of the flesh. He did it in the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, when John came, I say he was a success on any level. I think John had already had his uh, program from God and the Lord said, you better get busy, boy, because you're not going to be around here very long. No, sir, they'll chop your head off if you start preaching this. Boy, we do it a few men that are prepared to lose their heads for Jesus right now. I say again, most of you men know to preach better than you do know, uh, than you do preach, but you won't do it because you'll get kicked out of the synagogue, that's why. You really have to trust God and that'll be trouble, won't it? And you've been paying in the minister's pension fund. Oh, brother, wouldn't that be awful to have to sacrifice God for Jesus? You say, I lay everything on the altar, I set my golf clubs and my minister's pension fund and my big TV and if anything else you can have, Lord, but don't, don't intrude just too much on me, kind of thing. Oh, I like to think of John Baptist standing there, no sponsors, nobody to agree or disagree with him, he stood by, and, and, and they came to see this strange man, anointed by the Holy Ghost, and I tell you this, if a man is anointed by the whole folk will seek it. We have blinded our eyes to truth and we have put our fingers in our ears to the voice of God. And the judgments that are going to fall if we don't get revival, and maybe it is not an alternative of Christ or chaos, but Christ and chaos. Not revival or revolution, but revival and revolution. Not revival without concentration camps, maybe the only place you'll get it is in concentration camps. Oh, brother, we're heading for trouble, I'll tell you. Ah, the prophets were men who walked with God. They felt like God. They saw like God. They wept like God. They yearned like God. In America alone right now, we have, I dare to say this before God, I believe we have hundreds of millions of gospel cassettes. And we have millions of gospel books. And we have hundreds of Bible schools. And we've hundreds, over the year, we have hundreds of seminars. And we have people memorizing the scriptures. And we have about 5,000 radio stations who every day give some part of the scripture. And yet with all this stuff to feed on, dear God, where are we with all this stuff to feed on? 95% of us are spiritual cripples. Spiritual infants. Spiritual babes. Children full of self-pity, self-interest, self-seeking, self-concern, me first. And some people love God because he gives. We've got this wretched prosperity stuff. Paul's very clear, isn't he? Doesn't, doesn't he say, oh, well, writing to Timothy there, that you'll come a day when people think that gain is godliness? Some of God's choicest saints don't have another shirt to change. 
Peter said in his day, there are some who will make merchandise of you. That couldn't be more true than the day in which we're living. Somebody said to a friend of mine recently who might be doing some building for God, he said, listen, get me give you a word of advice. Don't build anything that will embarrass you in a few years. That's a very good point. I see God's money going in stately buildings and swimming pools and tennis courts and I want to vomit. With a world starving, with a mission field needing money, Paul never glamorized the gospel. It's a pretty gory gospel. It's a bloody gospel. It's a sacrificial gospel. I believe the cardinal ethic of Christianity is sacrifice. Not success, sacrifice. The most precious thing we ever handle is the human soul. There is only one way to heaven, there are a million ways to hell. What do you do to go to hell? Nothing. Just do nothing, that's all. You don't have to thumb your nose at God, you don't have to blaspheme the name of Jesus, you don't have to be adulterer. Just coast on. For the greatest sin in the world is not adultery, the greatest sin in the world is I can manage my life without God, that's the greatest thing. There is only one way to heaven, there are a million ways to hell. Just coast on. For the greatest sin in the world is not adultery. The greatest sin in the world is I can manage my life without God. That's the greatest thing. You say sometimes, I wonder God doesn't burden me. Do you know why? Because he can't trust you, that's why. You're not strong enough to carry the burden. A lot of you here this morning, you don't need more light. So this, this will only make it worse for you at the judgment. What you need is more obedience. Some of you known for years what you should do, and you hold back. Do you remember some of those awesome words Jesus said to the disciples? I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them. I say, Reverend the Almighty God, don't say that to me at the judgment seat. Don't let me stand before John Wesley and Finney and all the great saints of the ages. And say, Raven, I have many things to tell you. You're so preoccupied with this, so preoccupied. I couldn't get through to you. And if I could, you won't be mature enough to handle it. Five minutes inside eternity. I believe every one of us will have wished that we'd sacrifice more, prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, wept more. Five percent of Christians in the nation are weak. God can't trust them with vision. He can't trust them with burden. You can't trust children with jewels. You can't trust them with something that needs bravery. They're too timid. You can't trust them with a burden. You'll break them. Five minutes inside eternity. I believe every one of us will have wished that we'd sacrificed more, prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, wept more.